Good morning. So good to see everybody. How are we doing? Doing good, doing good. So good to see you. I want you to stand to your feet. Today's going to be a great day. If you're joining us online, we're glad you're with us. Let's worship. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, when everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, because he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? He won't believe that today. He won't. I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going under I'm not held by my own strength Cause I built my life on Jesus He's never let me down He's faithful in every season So I
Welcome again. Uh, So good to be with you today. Our God is powerful. He is mighty. We don't just sing. He won't fail. We believe it. We've seen it through creation, through his sacrifice and death and resurrection. He won't fail. He can't fail. He's faithful. I love that bridge when it talks about rains coming and challenges coming up in our lives. And, um, but he builds us up on a firm foundation. That's why we gather week after week to remember who he is, what he's done, but then to be strengthened. I love, love being in this room, uh, singing these songs, um, hearing scripture taught. And I feel like week after week, uh, he's just strengthening us as individuals and as a body um, with a firm foundation. Whatever you're walking through, whatever, whatever rains are coming down in your life, whatever storm, you're in, um, he's here, he's powerful, believe that he won't fail, don't just sing a song, he's faithful, he's good, and we're going to continue in worship, our hope today is to magnify Christ, our hope today is not just to uh, go through motions, but to encounter this living God that we do believe is faithful, let's pray together, Lord, thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you so much for your faithfulness. Thank you for your power and your might. And thank you that you're close, that you're near, that you're not far away. Today we trust that you'll meet us where we are. We believe that we cannot stay the same. So be glorified. Praise you in Jesus' name.
My life is yours. Sing it to him. And my hope is in you only. My heart you hold. Cause you made this sin. Your glory is so beautiful. I fall onto my knees in awe, and the heartbeat of my life is to worship in your love. Cause your glory is so beautiful. Your glory is so beautiful. You may. 
God, we proclaim with one voice that you are good. We praise you today. We long to hear your heart for us, for the world. We thank you for this opportunity, Lord. Again, be glorified in all you see and hear. Today is yours. We are yours. Put it in Jesus' power. Awesome. You sound beautiful today. All right, y'all can have a seat, and we've got a video that we'd like to share with you. My name is Kelly Mulliken, and I've been serving as a greeter for about four years. I get the most joy as a greeter getting to interact with our first time visitors. I know that coming to a new church for the first time can be really intimidating, especially if you're coming by yourself. You know, I was church shopping in town for multiple years and that's so hard, especially as a single person. And as soon as I walked in the door, I could tell that people were happy that I was there. They made an effort to ask my name make sure I knew where I was going. Even the people that I sat near in the sanctuary, the next week when I came back, they remembered me and they made it a point to ask how I was doing. And just that small impact, that those small moments made such a difference. So I wanna make sure that those people come in, they know where they're going, they know where their kids need to be taken, they know about the really good donuts. And I just wanna make sure that all of those first timers, again, feel seen and welcomed and know that at least the greeters will be looking out for them when they decide to come back. So feel free to come find me. I'd love to talk to you about serving as a greeter and I can't wait to serve alongside with you. Good morning. Welcome again to Dallas Bible Church. That video shouldn't put any pressure on you, but you better remember the people around you because they're going to they're gonna need you to remember their name next week. <laughs> no, I love that story from Kelly because that's so much of, uh, so many of us are stories of people here who are just um, showing intentionality and love. And so um, we are just excited to, to have another Sunday to be together and to worship. My name is Kristen Poole. I'm on staff here. And if this is one of your first weeks, like Kelly said, we're really glad that you're here. You may have some questions and you may want to connect with us. And so one of the best ways to do that is to go out to the welcome desk in the lobby. Come ask any questions you have. We'd love to get you in a group, get you serving, um, and help you connect here at Dallas Bible. Um, part of what Kelly's video was sharing is, is this campaign we've been in called Here to Serve. And so we're, as you know, we've been growing as a church. We've been trying to connect more people into service opportunities. And one of the ways that you can still serve is um, to sign up for our kids' ministry coming into the next ministry year. And so many of you I know have already said yes, and you're already planning to come to the training today. But a plug for anyone else. If in the back of your mind you've been thinking about serving in our kids' ministry, we have hundreds of kids in elementary who come every week, and they get to hear about Jesus, and they get to hear about how he changes our lives. And so it's an awesome, vibrant ministry. So if you weren't even planning to come today, but you're interested in kids ministry, we just want to invite you. We have a training going on after the second worship service in the fireside room. Come on in, get to know a little bit more about the philosophy, the heartbeat of our kids ministry, and you'll get to see um, kind of a few more details about what it would look like to serve with us in the coming ministry year. So we'd love to invite you to that. Um, okay, so sixth grade parents, you hopefully have this on your calendar, but we wanted to remind you next week is a sixth grade parent student info meeting. So there's a big change here in our church between fifth grade and sixth grade. And if y'all have fifth graders, you're kind of feeling that. They move from the elementary kids ministry up into youth ministry. And so you may have questions, you probably do, and we would love to have our youth ministers answer those questions and get you plugged in as we move into the summer. So don't forget to come next week, 1215. You don't have to sign up, just show up in the youth building. Building. Also, our youth are preparing to take trips to Florida for the high school and Oklahoma for the middle school. I hear the high school trip is already booked, but we've got a wait list. And so we wanted to remind you, um, if you want to go on those trips, please go ahead and sign up at dallasbible.org slash events. I'm assuming the Oklahoma trip will fill up pretty soon as well. So if you've got a student in middle school or high school, you'll want to go, go ahead and register them in the next week. And then finally, two weeks from now, we have been talking about Go and Be. 
We are super excited about the ways that we're gonna serve our community. And thank you, so many of you have gone to the lobby and signed up for anchor projects. Almost all of our projects are full, so thank you for that. If you haven't, we still have room for you um, in two weeks. Really specifically, one of our projects is called, um, we're partnering with Feed My Serving Children, and we have more spots in the noon to 2 p.m. slot. So if you have elementary kids or older, or if you're just a single adult or a couple, we would love to plug you in. That's a great ministry, um, and so that you can sign up for that in the lobby. And then secondly, many of you know we've been doing a community giveaway for years. It's kind of like a free garage sale where we invite people from the neighborhood. We invite refugee families, immigrants to come and to um, just take any of the house goods that they need. I was talking with Brian Radabaugh, and we've got an awesome team, but one of the things that we still need is we need more household items that are not furniture. So think kitchenware, tableware, um, decor, lighting. Think anything you'd fill your house with that isn't furniture. Even kids' toys. We get a lot of kids at the, at the Go and Be initiative, and we love to be able to like hand them toys. So, if in the next two weeks you have anything in your house that you're like, you know what, I don't need this anymore, we'd love to collect it and give it, a, give it out at Go and Be. Um, the best way to do that is on Saturday, April 27th. It's the day before Go and Be from 9 to 11. That Saturday morning, we're going to have the containers open in the back, bring all of your things, and then we'll get them ready to go to give out at Go and Be. Okay, thanks for hanging in there. That was a lot of announcements this morning. Let's go ahead. Let's spend a few minutes. If you'll stand with me, we'll greet those who we're worshiping with. All right, all right. Good morning, church. If you want to come on in and take your seat, we will continue this morning. Come on in. It is a joy to see you. Come on in. Good morning, church. It is awesome. I, you guys well know Go and Be is one of these weeks that I look forward to every single year. Uh, I say that every almost, oh, pretty much every single week as I look forward to most weeks and everything, but this is the time that church gets out into the community in a very unique way and, uh, and ga engages it. We kind of worship through serving that, that Sunday morning, and that is an incredible opportunity. And I hope you all are a part of it. Uh, if you've never been out to any of our uh, community giveaways, uh, you're going to see so many from the community. We partner with a lot of our partners uh, that are already out there in the community and families in need, and people bring their trucks, and we bring the trucks and load them up and move people into apartments and and uh, fill things up. And so really hope that you guys are able to be a part of that in the number of different ways that we go and be the hands and feet of Christ uh, to our community and to the world in which we live. And so it's going to be an awesome time. I have one more I wanted to throw by you. Last week, I talked a lot about forgiveness and I talked a lot about uh, healing and things like that. I wanted to make an announcement and I wish I would have done it last week a little bit better, uh, but about our Freedom Prayer Initiative. A number of people were reaching out this past week and uh, talking about getting some help for uh, how to let go, how to to forgive. And, uh, and we were talking about unity in the context of anger and how to be free of these things on the inside. And I should have done a better job of pushing uh, this initiative over here. Just to remind you that we have a freedom prayer team. And uh, many of you guys don't know what that is. And basically what this is, is it's kind of a, uh, it, it is a small group of people that would be meeting with you and, uh, and talking about things from your past that we're holding on to and really discerning what the Holy Spirit is saying biblically and truthfully in the middle of that moment so that we can come and actually be free uh, from the things that we walk in bondage in all the time. And it's an incredible ministry. If you'd like to get more information, there's the website. Uh, you can sign up for a time to come and meet with some people, and we would love to be able to walk you through that. We know that uh, th there are some heavy things that we walk in and hold on to all the time, but would love for us to be able to walk in freedom there. So hope you guys are able to go and be a part of that. Uh, I said go and be again, and so we will keep uh, going that way. But uh, this morning, we're going to keep going in Ephesians chapter 5 today. If you have your Bibles want to turn there, uh, that is where we're going to be. We're continuing 
continuing in this series that we've been in for quite a while, uh, looking at Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. Uh, We have turned the corner into the back part of the letter. These final few chapters right here are going to be the applications of about three chapters of beautiful, Christ-centered, gospel-centered theology about who God is, what he's done on our behalf, and it's all about those things. And then the final three chapters of this letter are going to be Paul basically applying it to the church and saying, here's what we go and do in light of what's been done on your behalf. And so we've been talking a lot about unity lately, Uh, unity when there is no uniformity, unity in the context of a church, unity when there's anger, and unity is not the thing that you want to do. Uh, This morning, I want to keep going, and we're going to get to chapter five here today. I want to talk about it in the context of marriage. And really how we can go and fight for unity in the context of a relationship that does not always have unity. How we can go and do marriage in such a way that is actually for everyone's good. And we're going to be looking at it in the context of a passage here that uh, is not always applied that way. But this is the question that many of us are asking today, uh, probably increasingly more today than before. It's the question of, okay, is marriage, uh, till death do us part, is that actually for my good? As a man coming into it or as a woman coming into it, uh, this giving myself to one person for the rest of my days in the context of this covenant commitment before God, like, is that actually for my good? Why not just keep my options open and have a little bit of fun? Uh, In fact, I was reading an article a little while ago that was talking about how divorce is actually on the decline today. Did you guys know that? Divorce is declining a little bit. Uh, I'm reading this. It's not a whole lot, but it's declining. I'm reading the article going, this is incredible. All right, like this is incredible. I can't believe that divorce may be declining a little bit more, but it continues to go on. And it says that the reason that it's declining uh, is not a good thing. The reason that it's declining is because the marriage rates are even more quickly on the decline. In other words, what's happening today is there's more cynicism and uh, there's more cynicism around the institution of marriage that is keeping us from walking into it today. It's the question of, is this actually for my good? Uh, It continued. I want you to hear a little bit of the uh, uh, the statements around this study and stuff. It said this. It said there there, there no longer seems to be much of a stigma attached to divorce. It is now seen as an unavoidable rite of passage, the researcher indicated. Interviews with young adults suggest that they want their initial marriage to last, but they're not particularly optimistic about that possibility. There's also evidence that many young people are moving toward embracing the idea of a serial marriage in which a person gets married two or three times seeking a different partner for each phase of their adult life. I don't know if you guys remember this a few years back, Kim Kardashian getting very, very famous for the kind of the statement of uh, the fourth time's the charm. And uh, just reason to say that is it's obviously very, very influential, but she went on and she explained it kind of like that. Hey, each phase of my life is different and I need a different partner. I need a different thing to be able to bring me each through each season of my life is a growing mentality that uh, is perpetuated much out there. 2010. Uh, Dana Adam Shapiro came out with a film called Monogamy, a uh, fascinating take on, on monogamy, the institution of marriage and stuff today. He interviewed 50 couples, and this is part of his own story behind it, where he's seeing so many people in his own world, their marriages dissolve and the couples be broken apart. And uh, so he interviews 50 different couples who are in the middle of breaking up. And his conclusion was that the difficulty with monogamy is this, that passion requires spontaneity. However, marriage requires a lot of duty. Therefore, that makes passion uh, nearly impossible to keep alive in the context of a marriage. Uh, Point of the matter is this is how much of us are thinking about marriage today. Is it even for my good? The irony of a question like that is deep down inside, most of us want to believe that it's for our good. Most of us want to believe that that's actually possible for me today. Uh, It's why we watch the movies that we watch. It's why we're addicted to the shows like Bachelor and Bachelorette, and and we love them and we, we absorb them all the time. It's why we watch like Hallmark Christmas movies in July. Uh, like anybody do that? I heard Jeff Mouser does that a lot. I, I heard you can razz him about that. But anyway, um, like Hallmark Christmas movies in July were brave heart if you're a dude and you're like still holding on to that like 40 years after the, ma- after the fact and everything. It, we, we look at these movies. We long for these things because there's this deep inner desire uh, that that can actually be true for me. That that long-term, God-glorifying, unified, cohesive, joy-filled, sacrificial, substantive type of a relationship can actually be true for me. And the problem is that it's just not always how we see it play out. And then beyond that, what God calls us to here in the middle of this text right here, um, it doesn't always naturally align with what we think will bring us life. And so the 
I love the way that Andy Stanley talked about it a number of years back. It was probably about 15 years ago now, but he said it like this. Uh, He said, falling in love is the easy part. Anyone with a pulse can fall in love. He said, staying in love for better or worse until death do you part. He said, that's the thing that's going to take a little bit of work. And it's exactly where Paul goes here at the end of this text. In the middle of this beautiful passage, here's how we then walk. Here's how we then should live. In the context of everything that God has done for us in Christ, this unity that we can have in the context of a body, unity in the context of this culture in this place where there is not uniformity, unity in the context of these times and places where we are erupting with anger, this unity that we are called to walk into, he says, it can actually be brought into the context of your marriage. Again, so if you have your Bible, you can go ahead and turn there. We're going to be in chapter 5 today. Um, I would remind you as we get into this text here on marriage that no time whatsoever Paul ever insinuates that life begins uh, at the moment that you say, I do. Some of you are sitting here kind of going, okay, well, that's not the life stage that I'm in. I'm not married right now, uh, or maybe I'm on the back end of a marriage. Uh, It's not in my future, or maybe it's not there yet. I'm kind of hoping that it is. We're coming from a number of different places on a subject matter like this, and I would just remind us that Paul never insinuates that life begins at the moment that you say, I do. Uh, Some of my most... uh, joy-filled times in ministry were times doing singles ministry back at the Northwest Bible days, and we would always come back to the Word of God. And even what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, when he says it may actually be for your good that you remain single, because then you can actually be single-minded in your devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's this unique thing where Paul lifts up both marriage and lifts up singleness in order to say, your highest and greatest calling is not the moment that you say, I do. As great as that may be, and as great and life-changing as that may be, and as essential as it is to the formation of the family, he's saying, your greatest and highest calling is to the Lord Jesus Christ, to serving him, loving him, knowing him wholeheartedly, and giving him the entirety of your being. And we know Paul's not just giving lip service to it or anything like that because he follows it up. And of course, he was, uh, he chose to be single for the entirety of his life. And then, of course, he did go on to become uh, one of the most fruitful believers that we've, uh, we've ever known. And so that to come and to say, just as we get into this thing, uh, there is a beauty, there is a thing for us, whether we are on the front end of marriage, not getting into marriage, or on the back end of this thing, because what Paul's going to say is that the entire context of marriage and how we interact together should be a picture of how God has loved us already in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so we get there in chapter 5, and it's fascinating. He turns the page. We can pick it up here in verse 1. And here's the context for this entire thing. He says, Therefore, follow God's example as dearly loved children. Walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. And so the context of this chapter is everyone. We've talked about it a lot. He says, walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Speaking to the entire community of believers, he's saying, no, 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 walk in the way of love. In light of what Christ has done, walk that way. He continues in verse 8. He says, you were once in darkness. Now you're called children of the light. So live as children of of the light. It continues in verse 18. Don't get drunk on wine, uh, which leads to debauchery. Uh, Instead, he says, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, Pretty straightforward text right there. And this is kind of what he's bringing us into right here. He says, don't be controlled by any other substance apart from the filling of the Holy Spirit. Because of what God has done for you, we've talked about this in the past, because the Spirit now lives inside of you, walk in such a way whereby He is going to be producing His life inside of you, and you're going to be living in submission to Him. Don't be controlled by wine. Don't, that's going to lead to debauchery. <laughs> so many of us know like that doesn't lead to great places. Uh, don't be controlled by those substances, he says. Be filled with the Holy Spirit uh, to the point that you're verse 19, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Holy Spirit. I always picture kind of a musical scene right there. We're just singing to each other and stuff, but um, not literally. But anyway, uh, sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, he says, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in that context, he says this in verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Jesus Christ. Wives to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Now husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her in order to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. 
In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one's ever hated their own body, but they feed and they care for their body, just as Christ does to the church. For we are members of his body. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And I love this next part. He says this. He goes, I know that this is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. In other words, he's going, I know that this may be a little bit confusing right here, but he's going, it could be that your marriage is a reflection of God's love for his bride, meaning the church, and the unity that we all have together. It could be that our vision for marriage is different than our own personal happiness. It could be that our vision for marriage, we're going into it saying, you know what, there's more at stake, there's more opportunity to be had, knowing that when I say I do, the way that we interact together in the context of this marriage has the opportunity to pay Paint the picture to a watching world of the love of God for us, which we've already received in the life, death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Two people giving fully of themselves to one another for the praise and for the glory of his name. And so it's like he comes back around to it at the very end in verse 33, and he's going, okay, I know this is a profound mystery right here, so let me bring it back to this. And this is kind of where he just simplifies it and boils it down very, very clearly and neatly right here in verse 33. He says, each one of you must love his wife as he loves himself. And the wife just must respect her husband. Not talking about exclusively kind of like, hey, what husbands, you don't need to respect your wives or wives, you don't need to love your husbands or anything like that. He's going, let me just boil this all down. Love your wife, love your wife, love your wife, respect your husband, mutuality in the middle of this whole thing. You hear some of this language and it seems a little bit like common sense. 2,000 years after the fact, uh, we're reading this, we go to the conferences, we talk about it all the time around here. Uh, it sounds like common sense to say things like love your spouse, uh, respect your spouse and things like that. I think it's important to understand it's not what was normative always at that particular context. In fact, one commentator wrote about it like this. He said, in ancient Ephesus, marriage was actually viewed as procreative and a public benefit union. In other words, it was more contractual in nature. People didn't marry for love 2,000 years ago they, in Ephesus at this point in time. They married mostly for function and were typically set up at the discretion of parents, family elders, or local matchmakers. Uh, how would you like a system like that? Uh, some of us are going, to go, you know what, I, I tend to trust their judgment better than mine. Like, that would actually work out pretty well. I had a, I've told you before, I've had a number of friends back at seminary and stuff come from different parts of the world, and they were set up through families and these arranged marriages, and they were taught how to love one another. They were already on the same page, and it's actually worked out really, really well for them. Uh, but this is how it often played out. It says, for a marriage to be valid, the man had to have the means of financially supporting a household, which meant that he needed to come from a wealthy and reputable family or marry into one and inherit the family business. Orphan girls were sometimes married to uncles or cousins within the family. And the betrothal, which was the first step towards marriage, was essentially a contract negotiation between the two families. Some of us ask, okay, is marriage good for us today? Can it be good for me? What do you think that they may have been asking back then? How can it be good for a woman? How can it be good for a man coming in and saying, all right, you just come in and you do that, I'll do this, we'll live together, we'll have kids, we'll stay out of each other's business and we'll kind of do that that way. And in this context is the beauty of what Paul is saying to this, to us, by the Holy Spirit as he begins this entire context and he says, submit to one another out of reverence for Jesus Christ. In other words, in Christ, there is a mutuality in your context of your marriage that you didn't even know existed. In other words, in the context of, hey, you sign this, you sign this, you do this, you do this, we're going to come together and we're going to come and, and, and simply fulfill some roles what Paul's coming in and saying to us is there is a mutuality here, there's a beauty here, uh, there's an opportunity here to reflect the love of God for us in Christ Jesus our Lord that we may not have even known existed. And so I love this passage, even though a lot of the words in it become trigger words and become these opportunities to take it places that were never, ever intended. There is beauty in what Paul is calling us into here in the middle of this marriage. The context for this beautiful marriage is two things at least. Number one, it's a mutual call to walk in the way of love, as we see here in verse one. Uh, he says, walk this way, walk in the way of love. Obviously, it's not the only time he calls us to walk in the way of love. That is a very general admonition right there that we've always been called to walk in. 
second. Uh, Number two is this mutual call to submit to one another, as we see here in verse 21. In other words, the umbrella for his instructions for how marriage should operate in the context of a Christ-oriented, gospel-oriented, God-loving relationship is that we would be submitting to one another. And so he's going right here. He's saying, hey, this is something that you've already done. I'm not beginning with this thing, uh, love and submission. It didn't begin at the moment that you say I do. He's saying, I've already been talking about this. You've already seen and we've already talked about God's love for us in Christ. You've seen how that plays out. You've already known and seen how submission plays out culturally and how there's moments and times where we yield to one another for the sake of the other person's good. And so he's saying, what you see and do out there, bring that into the context of your home. Don't just leave it out there, but these things that we've been calling you to walk in as a result of what God has done for us in Christ, bring that into the context of your home. Uh, and, other, it, and I think this is worth repeating sometimes too, because uh, many of us know that sometimes in the context of the home are the hardest places to apply this. Uh, what he's calling us into is very similar. I love the movie Karate Kid. Uh, it, it's the way that uh, Daniel LaRusso was trained by Mr. Miyagi. You may remember this. Uh, he's getting bullied by a bunch of his friends. Greatest movie on the planet and everything. Uh, he's getting bullied by his friends. He goes to Miyagi and he says, I need to learn how to fight. I need to, I need to learn t- karate. And so he's like, fine, I'll train you. He goes to Miyagi's home. You remember what he does? He hands him the paintbrush and he says, paint the fence. And then he hands him like the waxers and he's like, wax the floor. And then he's like, or wax the car and whatever the different things are down there and stuff like that. And you remember the whole movie and stuff. LaRusso gets a little bit angry. He's frustrated. He's like, I came here to learn how to fight. Why aren't you teaching me how to fight until this point in time when he finally realizes that by painting the fence and by waxing the car and all the different things, he's been learning to fight the entire time. It's exactly what Paul's saying. We've been teaching you how to love. We've been teaching you how to submit to one another. We've been teaching you how to defer. We've been teaching you what to do in the context of anger. We've been teaching you how to have unity when there is no uniformity. We've been calling you into all these things because of what God's done for you in Christ. And now I'm calling you to go and to bring those same things into the context of your home. And so you do all these things in the context of your home. John 13, a new command that I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. James says, uh, there's a wisdom from heaven that is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, good fruit, impartial, and sincere. Uh, Nevertheless, he comes and he brings it into the context of this home because the things that we are bringing out that bring about unity and beauty in the context of marriage are not the things that are naturally, that we're naturally inclined to do. In fact, a number of years ago, uh, a Gallup poll, 1999, so there's a number of years ago now, did a study where they interviewed a, um, a couple thousand random adults around the country. They found that 65% of the people who were polled hated this idea of submission. And many of you know that you hear a word like submission, you hear headship, uh, maybe you kind of groan inside of your heart, knowing coming, we're coming into Ephesians chapter 5, and they said that 65% of the people polled heard that word and groaned and, and said that, oh my gosh, this is a horrible, horrible thing, hated the idea of submission. They continued in the research and said that pretty much everyone agreed with the rest of the passage that husbands should love his wife, kids should obey their parents, parents shouldn't exacerbate their kids, which is chapter 6 we get into later. Um, But 69% of those who were polled strongly disagreed with verse 22 right here, that a wife should willingly, not forcibly, but willingly submit to her husband. And it only dipped to 60% when they were reminded that it's a biblical command. And again, many of us come into a thing like this, and we know these words, and we know the language associated with it. We know how often these things can go sideways and not turn into the beautiful thing which God has imagined and given us to do in the middle of this, in the middle of the the context right here. We know the negative connotations associated with it. You watch MMA fighting or anything like that. A submission is what you do, last thing you do before you tap out, and like you're unconscious right? It is not typically a good thing. That's what you do. You tap out and you submit. You give up and you say, I've got nothing else left. Typically not a good thing or anything like that. In war, it's the act of giving up or rising the white flag or anything like that. And so you know the connotations that are associated with it. Told you a number of times ago, uh, uh, um, one of our good friends is doing missions work over in Afghanistan and in in different parts of the Middle East. And uh, talking about as an American woman coming over there, having every inch, the way that this gets applied, having every inch of your body completely covered and not being allowed to look at another man in their eyes. 
Otherwise, you could be punished and actually put into prison, which some of her friends have been put into prison in these contexts and stuff. She's telling a story about how one of them was actually assaulted, and then she was the one that was thrown into prison for sexual crimes and things of that nature in the middle of that context. We know how sideways some of these things go. We know some of the misapplications and the terrible places that these things often go. Uh, it's why, in fact, God warns us about this in Genesis chapter 3, where he's describing the impact of sin coming into the world, the curse of sin on the world in Genesis chapter 3. When he says to the woman, he's described the, the pains of, uh, of working on men, but he says to the woman, he says, I'm going to greatly increase your pains in childbearing, and with pain you will give birth to your children. Your desire will be for your husband. Uh, the word that he uses right there is teshukatek, which is the word um, for a very strong desire for your husband, often a dominating, controlling kind of a desire. And what he's saying is your desire may be over there, yet now that sin is in the picture, it's not going to go well, and he will often rule over you. Uh, it's none of it is prescriptive for how it should be. This is God coming in and saying it is descriptive of the impact of sin coming into the world, saying it's not going to go well. There's going to be these issues in the context of your relationship together, husbands and wives. It is not naturally going to play out into this mutuality, this beautiful thing where we are giving towards one another, which is the beauty of this context as Paul comes into this and says, that's not how it's supposed to be done. He's coming in here and he's saying that there is a different way for it to go. It does not need to read like in Genesis chapter 20, Abraham hands over his wife to Abimelech like she was nothing. Genesis 34, you see the ways that this plays out. Uh, Dinah is raped, and dad's not very concerned about it. You see the dynamics play out all throughout history. Judges 19, a dad hands over his young daughter to an angry mob of people in order to protect a young strange man who he doesn't even know who's come to stay at his home. Even today, 93% of all domestic violence cases are reported by women. And if the stats are right, somewhere around one in three to four adult women have experienced some sort of domestic violence at some point in their life. Point of the matter is we know how often this can go sideways. Yet this is the beauty of what Paul is coming into and saying to us in the middle of this text because he's saying that this is not the way that it was ever intended to go. You've heard about submission, but I'm calling you to submit to one another. You've heard about it going over here, and it may have been screamed to you over here, but I'm calling you as you think about your marriage that there would be two people, husbands and wives, looking at this thing saying, okay, submit to one another. I'm going to give to you. I'm going to give to you. I'm going to give to you, and I'm going to give to you. Paul's saying that's not the way that God has called you to go in Christ. Because of Christ, there's a brand new normative that should be, de that should be describing your relationship, and it begins in verse 21 that we submit to one another. You've heard about contracts. You've heard about obligations. You've heard about responsibilities, but he's going, husbands, I'm calling you to also love your wives and to not be harsh with them, as he says in Colossians chapter 3. In other words, I know that harsh might be the norm. I know that harsh, because of a sin entering into the world, like harsh might be the norm, or maybe not the norm, but sometimes the exception. I know that harsh could be uh, the reality over here, and Paul specifically rebukes that. He says, be loving towards your spouse. Don't be harsh with them, is what he says right there. Love them in such a way that reflects the active love of Christ uh, when he willingly chose to lay down his life for the flourishing of his bride. And this is where he begins in the context of marriage. Two people actively following and looking at Christ, his love and submission towards us, who being in very nature God, Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, he didn't consider equality with God as something to be grasped or used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And this is what submission is. And this is what he's calling us to in the context of marriage, this intentional yielding or lowering of yourself for the long-term good of another. And so, ladies, when you see it repeated in verse 22 over here, we have to understand that it's not a demotion. It is not a slight to your worth. It is not a prescription for abuse. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in just a moment. It's not any of these things. It is a call for you to be included in this relationship and pursuing unity with your husband in a way that has already been modeled by Christ, who is both fully God and fully man, co-equal with the Father and the Holy Spirit, and still saw fit to come down to heaven and to take on flesh that you and I may be saved and have life now and for all of eternity with him. 
It's modeled by Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane when he prayed right before he moved towards the cross. Father, yet not my will, but your will be done. Father, if there's any other way to go about the, the restoration of humanity and the forgiveness of sins apart from the cross, if there's any other way, God, I would gladly have it yet at the end of the day, not my will, but your will be done. And so church, there's beauty and submission. There's beauty and submission, especially when two people see it as theirs to own. And two people are coming and saying, you know what? I'm going to lay down for you. And I'm going to submit myself. I'm going to yield to you. Two people coming in the middle of that context. There's beauty in the context of submission. Nevertheless, it gets repeated here to wives because it's not something that we should ever give up. And as we look at this passage, to deal with the nuances and the complexity of it, we have to come before the word of God and say, okay, like, where, God, what is it that you would have for me to do? How do I think about this today? In light of all the things that we know that it's not, ladies, we come and we look at this and say, okay, in light of all the things that it's not, I know that it's not submitting to evil. I know that it's not submitting to sin. I know that I'm calling to follow him first and no husband gets a, has a right to come and to lead me apart from him. I'm not submitting to any of these things over there. I'm not submitting to some sort of an authoritarian, dominating type of a control. I'm not submitting to a lifestyle of passivity and voicelessness or anything like that. I'm not talking about any of these things over here. But it is coming back and saying, okay, in light of all that it's not, Father, what is it right now for me? God, am I willing to come and to say, okay, God, how have I and how would you have me come and submit in the context of my marriage right now? And, and to be able to ask the question and say, okay, is there anything that I can look at recently or at any point in my past that says, you know what? Okay, God, I've come before you and maybe in the moment of a disagreement or maybe in the middle of I don't know where to go or something like that. Father, out of reverence for you and my relationship with you, God, I'm willing to lay down and I'm willing to give myself and trust you in the middle of this moment. And we have to come back and say, okay, I know all the things that it's not over here, but what is it? And and am I willing to submit to that? Am I willing to give myself to that and to say, God, I'm trusting you in the middle of this thing right over here? Remember years ago, I was doing a, um, I was doing a lot of premarital counseling with a couple that I had a chance to get to know for a number of years at that point in time. And, and um, we were having a fascinating conversation, but we were kind of coming together. And I asked the guy, and I was like, hey, uh, tell me a little bit about your relationship. Tell me a little bit about uh, what you love about her. What, what, who, who are you guys? And, and uh, what, what did you fall in love with? And, and what's going on over here? And we were asking both of them, but I was talking with him at that point in time. And I remember, I love the way that he described what he was seeing. He goes, you know what? Uh, he's like, from the very beginning, I've seen incredible godliness and humility all over her life. And he goes, quite honestly, there's not anybody in my life that God has used more to bring me back to him than what I've seen in her. And he describes this time and how they're kind of getting into the marriage and they're looking at, they're looking at the wedding day. And uh, it was one of these situations, parents weren't able to pay for anything like that. And so uh, they, he was paying for most of it himself and everything. And her dreams were a little bit higher than his and what it would be and all the things. And so they had this conversation about, okay, here's what we can spend and here's what we can do. And uh, they had this incredible conversation with it. It was a little bit deflating and everything. And he goes, you know what? Uh, He's like, I wasn't mandating anything by any stretch of the imagination, but she just kept coming back. And, uh, and, and she actually brought in receipts. I never asked for receipts or anything like that, but she's looking at this budget and she's wanting to honor our relationship moving forward. And she goes, I've, he goes, Aaron, I've, I've never seen anything like that before where you would just come in and just honor the thing that's right there in front of us. And, and he goes, you know what? God has used her to bring me back to the Lord. He was not walking with the Lord uh, like he should have been at the very beginning, but he goes, you know what? God has used her and her godliness and willingness to follow him more than anybody else to bring me back to him. I'm telling you, church, like it's beautiful and it's powerful what he is calling us to here in the middle of this text, to be able to give to him and defer and to be able to say, you know what, I'm going to submit to you. And and in the same way that Paul is coming and in in a little bit, he's going to give a little different instruction to the husbands right over here, but all saying basically the same thing in a lot of different ways that they were going to come in in the middle of this relationship and say, you know what, I'm going to give to you and I'm going to give to you. And there's this beautiful mutuality in the context of this relationship. He continues and says in verse 22, he says, Wives, submit to your own husbands out of reference for Jesus Christ, because the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church, 
which means that in God's divine wisdom, he's decided to add an extra responsibility to the husbands to steward this relationship well. It's not that either one are ever apart from responsibility. Nevertheless, to the husband, he says there's an added responsibility to come and to make sure that this relationship goes really, really well. It does not mean that anyone's without responsibility, but it does mean that husbands should come in and they have a responsibility to initiate a Christ-like love in such a way that sees her flourishing. That's what headship is. It's defined in the text. It is a responsibility to initiate Christ-like love. He says, husbands, love your wives. Love them is the action that he's calling you to. Not just contractually, not just sign this piece of paper and, and take care of your provision elements over here. Not just go to work and take care of it over there. No, no, no. The thing that I'm calling you to here that is brand new, I'm calling you to love your wife. I'm calling you to love her, not just in a passive way, not just in a feel it one time, say it one time when you said I do, hope that she gets it, but he's going, no, 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 actively love her. Here's what I'm calling you to do. Be a man that is incredible at love. The actions, not just the feelings of love. Love her every single day. Uh, I'm calling you to do the works of love. The hero that he gives us in the text is not Joe Rogan. It's not John Wayne. It's not Bruce Wayne. It's any of the things we've talked about in the past. It's not your coaches. It's not your father. As great as your father may have been. It's not our man crushes today. And whoever the hero of masculinity is today, the example that he gives us is Christ. And the example that he calls you to follow right here is Christ, not just him in the heavenlies, feeling all these feelings of love towards his bride, the church, but Christ coming down, laying down his life for the flourishing of his bride. It's Jesus in Matthew chapter 20 when he says, whoever wants to be great among you must first be a servant. Whoever wants to be first must first be a slave. So the son of man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. It's Jesus in John chapter 13 when he's on his hands and his knees and he's washing his disciples' feet. And of course, it's Christ, not in the heavenly, he's not just feeling all the feelings of love, but it's Christ on the cross when he chooses to lower himself for the long-term flourishing of his bride. And so, husbands, that's the example that's been given to you. How do you enter into marriage and operate in the context of a marriage that's for her flourishing and not your own? You look at Christ. How in the world do you come and you fl- enter into a marriage and you operate in such a way that's, that both of you are going to be lifted up, that God's going to be glorified in the end? The example given to you is that you would look at Christ. And I'm always going to argue, he says, love you. He says, love her is the language that he uses right here, love her that you would be a people that major in love, that you would know what that means. Even before all the books on leadership, even though leadership may be implied in that, he says, love her. And I'm always gonna argue that the word and the language actually matters right here because there is a brand of leadership that is all about or has more to do with power and authority and how to get your way. It is a very popular brand of leadership today. And the problem is it just doesn't always look like Christ lowering himself and giving himself for the long-term flourishing of his bride. And so here's Paul going, if you would just embrace that responsibility, keep your eyes upon him as you initiate with a Christ-like love, then the irony is you would actually be leading really, really well. And so he says, love her, love her. Husbands, you want to know how this goes well? Love her. Fix your eyes upon Christ who lowered himself, went to the cross, gave up his life for the long-term flourishing of his bride. It's not passive. It's not arbitrary. It's got definition to it. I want you to notice how he talks about it in verse 26, how he gave himself up for her in order to make her holy, how he cleansed her by washing her with the water of his word. It's a fascinating way of talking about it right there. It's one that's honestly is only unique to Christ, the way that he was able to do that through his word and through his sacrifice right there. Nevertheless, I think it leads to a couple questions for husbands. And I would ask you this. Number one, are you making sure that there is a cleansing ministry of God's word in your home? And we see the sacrificial love of Christ towards his bride, the church, that cleansed her through the power of his word. And I would come back and I would ask this question, are you making sure that there is a cleansing ministry of God's word that's happening in your home? Or are we being passive and sitting back in it, hoping that things kind of get absorbed? Is there a cleansing ministry of God's word in your home? The reason I say it like that, rather than, hey, go lead the Bible study, teach the things and things like that, it's not what he's calling us to right here. He's not saying, hey, you've always got to be a step ahead. He's not saying, hey, you've always got to know more. No, no, no. He's not saying, hey, you've got to go and mansplain the entire thing. Terrible idea. He's not saying any of these things, but there is a responsibility. Let's make sure that we are a couple that is centered around God's word and that God's word is having its way in the middle of our relationship to where it is pursuing cleansing and beauty within us. Is there a cleansing ministry of God's word in our home? 
I'll give you an example of this. A number of years back, we were kind of coming in, and uh, I was talking with another couple, some friends of ours and stuff, and he was coming back into the faith. She had been walking with the Lord for a number of years at that point in time. They are coming together, and they're getting married, and, and it's this beautiful thing that's going on, and he was just very, very nervous. He's like, I don't know what to do about this. Like, she knows everything. I'm just coming into this thing, and like, what does this mean for anything? And we're going, no, 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 don't slow down. No, you don't stop over there or anything like that. There's no more holding back. There's a great book about, about that. We're not talking about slowing down or anything like that. But he's sitting there kind of going, okay, what do I do? How do I do this? I don't, I don't know much about Bible study. I don't know much about anything. I don't know how much about reading. And he comes back and he says, you know what? We had an incredible conversation about it. And I just asked, I said, hey, I don't know what to do about this. I know that the word is supposed to be in the middle of our relationship. Like what would be helpful for you and for us that we can grow in this thing here together? And they talked about it, and they just set aside a time each night. They said, you know what? This time every single night is very quiet for us. And they got into this rhythm of coming and saying, you know what? I'm going to have my time in my word. I'm going to have time in my word. And we're going to come together at the end of the time, and we're going to come back. We're just going to talk a little bit about what God is saying in the middle of his word. And he's like, Aaron, you would not believe the amount of beauty and unity that came in the middle of this thing. He goes, we used to sit around dinner tables at night, and we would just stare at each other and have absolutely nothing to talk about. He goes, you won't believe, like all of a sudden we had things to talk about. All of a sudden God's doing things and he's teaching things to me. He's teaching things to her. We're talking and we're interacting and we're pursuing the Lord together. You won't believe what God has done in the middle of that thing. There's so many different couples and stuff around here that are looking at it kind of going, you know what, uh, here's our rhythm over here. I know one couple, they're both auditory learners, and one of them will read it out loud to the other before bedtime because they're not great readers and things like that. Other times they'll go and they'll do the little auditory uh, Bible app kind of a thing and listen to it out loud uh, at different times and come together and, and they'll talk about it together, coming under the authority of God's word and letting it produce this cleansing and this healing that's there inside. And I would just ask you, are you making sure that there's a cleansing ministry of God's word that is happening in your home? That's what this is, a responsibility to initiate Christ-like love through a cleansing ministry of his word. He continues in verse 28. He says, in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife also cares for himself. After all, no one's ever hated their own body, but instead they feed and they care for their body just as Christ does the church. Husbands, I would ask you the question. I would say, are you breathing life into her in such a way that sees her flourishing? Are you breathing life into her in such a way that sees her flourishing? The initiation of any kind of Christ-like love is going to see her flourishing in the ways that God has created her to flourish, designed her to flourish. Are we paying attention to the unique ways in which she's been designed? Are you paying attention to the unique seasons that you may be in in the context of your marriage, right? Like there's so many different seasons that play out. Sometimes you don't have kids. Maybe that never comes. Maybe it does come. Maybe they're young. Maybe they're in adolescent years and they're becoming a little bit more independent. Maybe they're empty nesters and they're got they're gone. Uh, maybe it's the aftermath of the entire thing, and there's so many different seasons. But are you coming and looking at these different seasons, and are you looking at your spouse in such a way that says there's a unique beauty, and there's a unique calling into which God has called them to walk into, and are we bringing that out and breathing life into our spouses here today? Not just saying, hey, you, you exist for this thing over here, but here are the unique ways in which you've been designed by God and called to flourish. Remember Priscilla Shire talking about this a number of years ago. Uh, they were talking about the context of her marriage and a very, very unique marriage. If you don't know Priscilla Shire, uh, one of my heroes in the faith, Tony Evans uh, is a pastor out on Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship, uh, fantastic pastor, preacher. Priscilla is his daughter, uh, exceptional preacher in her own right. She's an actress. She's so many different things, author, Bible study writer, wife, mom, all these different kinds of things. And she's talking about the unique dynamics with her and her own husband. And uh, her husband speaks up and he says, yeah, basically come to the point where he's coming and he's managing and helping support her career in a number of different ways like that. But he says this, she sa he says, uh, my wife has a unique gift and calling to serve the Lord. Uh, and I've been called to lay down my life for the sake of the gospel and for her flourishing. And this is the best way that I know how. In other words, I am seeing what God is doing in her life. I know my gifts as a manager, and I know what God has called me to do. And we are coming and we are bringing this together so that Christ can be glorified as best as he possibly can in the context of this marriage. And I would ask you, are we looking around at our spouses and saying, this is what's unique, and this is what's beautiful, and this is what God has called you to do, and here's where I see God moving, and are we breathing words of life in such a way that is seeing your spouse flourish? 
look around the church and see so many success stories all over the place. I'm thinking about uh, the number of people that are looking around at their spouse and they're saying, you know what, I see a unique gift of mothering, specifically with a call towards foster care and adoption and so many things like that. I, I know what God has done in you. I see this unique heart about you. Uh, I remember talking with one husband a number of years ago and he's sitting there kind of going, okay, I see this happening in her. I didn't know exactly what to do with it. And so I brought it before the Lord and I said, okay, God, would you help me be a man that can come and bring this out and help this flourish. God, that you're going to be glorified in this thing. He starts praying about it, and the Lord changed his heart and his affections inside, and they go and adopted a whole other family and all these different beautiful things. But you're sitting there saying, okay, God, what is going on inside of my wife? Are we breathing life into each other in such a way that is seeing flourishing take place? Looking around at so many people here that have said, you know what, this is a time. I see what God's doing in you. This may be a time for you to come back to school and to go pursue school, or to go pursue this over here, or to go do this, or this may mean that I step back from a responsibility over here so that I could be a lot more present at home and to make this whole thing happen. Are you paying attention to these nuances, and are we speaking life into each other in such a way that is seeing each other flourish? Again, church, I just look at this, and I'm saying we have to redeem these words. We have to redeem these words. We have to redeem these words and not look at these triggers and stuff and say, oh my gosh, all I can see is the negativity. All I can see are the ways that these things go and, and, and it, you know, they get abused or they get mistreated or whatever it may be. To look at the context and look at the entire thing and to say, okay, here's what God is calling us into so that he could be glorified in the middle of this whole thing together. A few weeks back, a friend shared an article from the National Marriage Project thought it was a fascinating article. It was a study that they did back in 2000, uh, 2022, actually. Um, and they were marking the differences and the kind of the, uh, the contextualization of how it played out in the context of marriage. The differences between secular men, nominal Christian men, and, uh, and the, the other designation was a devout Christian man. And they de defined it a number of different ways. Obviously, the secular person was somebody who didn't believe in God whatsoever, had no religious association whatsoever. The nominal man was somebody uh, who was Christian more so in name only. This is the checkbox that I kind of say. I'm not very engaged in the life of the church or any kind of spiritual disciplines or anything like that. And they define the devout Christian man as someone who is engaged in the life of the church at least two to three times a month and uh, was actively pursuing the Lord, be it through some sort of spiritual disciplines outside of that. And here's what the article concluded. It said that what they found was that a nominal Christian man was 20% more likely to divorce than even a secular man. They scored the highest rates of domestic violence of any group that was polled, even more so than the secular men. They spend less time with their kids than anyone, even a secular man. And they picked personal fulfillment as their primary goal for marriage. Meanwhile, a devout Christian man was shown to be more loving more emotionally engaged with their wives and children than any other male group in America. They are the least likely group to divorce and 35% less likely than a secular man. They've got the lowest rates of domestic violence. I don't know exactly how they measured this, but it was 2.8% versus 7.8%. Um, I don't know how accurate that can be if you're just polling and asking questions about that. Nevertheless, uh, there was a marked difference and stuff be between the people that were pursuing the Lord Jesus Christ and the nominal believers that were doing it in word only, likely holding on to titles or things like that rather than the, uh, what God has actually called us into in Christ. They've got the lowest rates of domestic violence. Uh, the article continued and said that 73% of wives married to devout Christian men were happily married, which was by far the highest designation. 70% of the men reported uh, that they were very happy also in their marriage, which was also the highest in the group. And it talked about how devout Christian men have a strong view of fidelity, permanence in marriage, and the priority of the family to the point that they spend three and a half more hours each week with their kids than nominal men. You think it matters? You think it matters, this pursuit of Christ and the seeing him and letting him be the thing that shapes me inside, letting him be the one that shapes the way that I'm viewing my marriage, the way that we're interacting with one another, you think it does anything for the good of the wife when she comes home and where she's there and she's seeing husband coming and being a part of the family and initiating Christ-like love in the context of a home? You think that might like produce a little bit of intimacy, a little bit of joy, contentment, satisfaction? 
And all they're doing is just embracing the responsibility and fixing their eyes upon Christ. And when they do, women and children flourish along the way. I'm telling you, church, he knows how to bring you joy. He knows how to bring you joy. He knows how to bring you joy. And in the middle of this context of, yeah, 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 I know the different ways it goes wrong, he obliterates those ways. And he blows the whole thing up. He says, just look at Christ. Look at Christ. You want to know how to do this thing? Would you look at Christ? Submit to one another. Give fully of yourselves to one another. Submit. Don't toss out submission. Don't think it's a bad word. Christ did it. He modeled it for us. Don't toss it out the window. Don't think it's got no place for you today. Don't only look at what it's not. Look at what it is. But would you look at Christ? And in looking at Christ, would you allow his humility Would you allow his sacrificial love to come and to permeate every bit of your being to the point that you've got two people coming together, giving fully of themselves for the praise and for the glory of his name? It's my hope and my prayer for you today that life would be breathed into you, that life would be breathed into your marriage, that life would be breathed maybe into a future marriage, that you may breathe life into people around you who may be in that state, who might be in that situation and everything, but that life would be breathed into you today all for the praise and for the glory of his name. And so I want to invite you to pray with me. But Father, we love you, God, and we just say thank you, Lord, for what you've given to us in Christ. God, I thank you that, um, God, there's no, <laughs> there's no confusion of, really about what you've called us into, God. That you in the fullness of glory, fully God, fully man, you chose to lower yourself and to give yourself for the flourishing of your bride. Lord, I pray right now in Jesus' name, God, that you would breathe life into us today. Father, I want to pray for any wives that have come in today. Maybe they are feeling deflated. Maybe they were feeling tired and exhausted. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would give them a vision for what could become. God, I pray that you would do the same thing for husbands that are coming in today. Maybe they're walking in, maybe a little bit more on the passive end of things. Lord, I pray that they would rise up and initiate this Christ-like love which you've called us to walk in today. Maybe they're coming in and they're bringing in way too much domination, authoritarian control, that kind of a thing, Lord Jesus. And it is for the crushing of a spouse. I pray that you would humble them right now in Jesus' name. God, that we would fix our eyes totally and completely upon you, oh God. That we would take joy in giving of ourselves fully to one another for the praise and for the glory of your name. So church, I just want to give you a moment wherever you may be. Would you just take a moment and just acknowledge and say, okay, God, am I willing to follow you in this? What is it that you would have for me today? Would you give him a moment to speak and in just a few moments we'll come together and we'll sing again.
sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. Won't you stand up with me? And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in our confession and prayer together. We need you and help us to rely on you more and more every day as you lead us, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great day.